Father Richard. Father Richard. Alan wants you to start with a prayer so that everyone's quiet. Good evening, everyone. They want me to start with a prayer because you EastEnders are all noisy and loud. But it's great. It's wonderful to see all of you here. If you can just take a moment. A moment in prayer. Certainly we want to ask God to bless Alan as he's about to retire. But also, we ask God to enlighten us and help us to see what a blessing that Alan has been for this school and for our community here. God bless you, Alan. May God be with you always, give you great health, and we'll see you at the opera. <laughs> In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Have a good evening. Good evening. <laughs> that wasn't an invitation to speak. Welcome to Remembering Alan Charlton. My name is Joe Dardano and I'm a teacher at the school and a former student of Alan, as many of you are as well. And I'm your MC this evening. Alan figured no one would be here tonight. <laughs> so Alan, I think we're doing pretty well, as you can see. I'm not sure if you saw the original invitation, however, when it was printed in my parish bulletin, my mother was confused. She called me and she asked, when did Alan pass away? <laughs> Remembering, join us as we say goodbye to Alan Charlton. <laughs> goodbye, Alan. <laughs> Stephanie Chan, who's also a member of staff, was receiving similar phone calls as well. Um, and so her and I were screening some phone calls a few weeks ago. It was a little awkward, but indeed, um, hopefully you guys are here uh, to, um, not to pay your respects, I guess, but to share your memories with Alan. Tonight we pay tribute and honor a barely living legend. <laughs> Alan taught for 55 years, serving Notre Dame for more than two life sentences, a record that will never be broken. Our first speaker was Alan's colleague for over 30 years and our past school principal. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Phil Ledoux. Alan. Someone showed up. He's been worried that this event would be called and no one would show up. But what bothers me, Alan, is that they showed up and you got all these smiles on their faces. Do they realize the school's closing? It isn't opening in September. It can't go on without you, Alan. No way. Anyways, it's a pleasure to be here. And I thank uh, Sue Cirillo and uh, the introduction by Joe, to speak about and to an old friend. Notre Dame has been in existence for 64 years, and Alan has been a part of it for 53. Remarkable record. I said to Alan many times, over the last decade or 15 years, when is he going to retire? Why doesn't he retire? And I'm going to talk a little later about other laments he has, but one of his lament is that he comes back to me and he says, what am I going to do? I said, what do you mean you're going to do when you're retired? That's not a problem. He says, well, my evenings, my dance card's always full, but what am I going to do in the daytime? Alan, you're going to need every working daylight hour to spend your momentous CISVA pension. You know. <laughs> I met Al, Alan, he was sometimes called more affectionately by Bill Cole and George and myself and I think Al Blesh, Charlie. I'll, I'll get that, to that history in a few moments. In September of 1964, 
And before I met him, or let me say this first, those back in the days when Notre Dame was run by the Sisters of Charity of Halifax, and I say that, and it was an honor to work for them, but there were 17 sisters and three lay teachers. It was not an even split. And they had their way until the first staff meeting and they weren't used to people speaking up. And you know, as I was preparing for tonight, I was thinking of Alan, that quiet, unassuming, reserved, gentle man. None of those thoughts came to my mind about Alan, okay? So you know what that first staff meeting went uh, like, and it was uh, an experience, and from there, it was uphill all the way as far as <clears throat> the school's concerned. But early on, I had a hard time <clears throat> this gentleman I was meeting, heavy, much heavier than now, English accent, and he liked to brag a bit about where he came from and what he did in the past, having been a graduate of Oxford. All I knew about Oxford is there was another little school over there, I think it was called Cambridge, and they used to row boats down some river in some competition or whatever, but I didn't know much about it, and I forget what, how it went one day, but anyways, he said something that I didn't particularly like, and I guess I must have said something back to him. Something like, why did you come? And Alan's answer is only Alan could give. I came to raise the tone in the colony. <laughs> now in the early days on staff, our salaries weren't that great. I'm not afraid to tell you what I have. I started Notre Dame with a gross salary. It was gross in many ways. Uh, $3,200. And it really bugged me he made more because supposedly, I say supposedly, he had a master's degree. But it didn't matter. We, none of us had any money. So going to a movie was an event. It was a social event. We planned it. I went to at least one or two movies a year. That's about all I could afford. Alan never missed a movie. I don't know how he did it, but he... So he became our movie critic. And those of you who are faithful to the BC Catholic know what I'm talking about. He never missed many live performances in town, the symphony, any... Alan, you're still doing that? That's what you're gonna do in the daytime, between finding how to invest your CISVA pension, okay? All right. <clears throat> Anyways, he was a movie critic. So the first, we were in maybe school, maybe a month. Let's go to a movie. So I'm not sure if Al came, but anyways, we went to the movie. It was a wonderful movie. I forgot the name. <laughs> but it was black and white. It was French with subtitles. And I came out saying, this is supposed to be an event. And I spent my money on something I don't even understand. <laughs> Over the next few years, he would give advice as what movies to go to. And finally, not being the sharpest knives in the door, myself and Al would say, Alan, what movie should we go to? And he'd tell us. And we'd go to something else. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, all Al and I wanted was a Western. <laughs> I have a few experiences that no one else, I don't believe, in this room could possibly have had with Alan. And the first of those experiences, I had the experience for three summers, or was it four, or was it five? No, it just seemed like four or five. <laughs> three summers of attending university at Western Washington State College with Alan Charlton. It was about the time that we both felt that we had degrees, but maybe we should get the window dressing that the Department of Education said was your PDP. So we decided to go there. And the reason we didn't go here is because UBC wanted you to take a year off. And in those days, we weren't so sure about Simon Fraser. It was still just in its infancy. Anyways, we went to Western Washington. And that was an experience. We shared the driving. He's living in the North Shore. I'm living in New West, which he'd come and pick me up or he'd come to my place and I would drive. Anyways, we'd get to Western Washington, classes start at nine, park our cars, usually late, and we usually parked where we weren't supposed to park. And it became a game as to how many parking tickets we could 
a crew over a period of time. And we just put them in our glove box. And every once in a while, we'd take a tally to see who was ahead in the score of these parking tickets. You know, I can say things like this when you're not a teacher, eh? Have the students heard this? Anyways, I wouldn't recommend you do that today because I hear they're building walls down there, so you don't want to be doing that today. <laughs> Anyways, university class with Alan, let me explain. John Grant, I'm sure, supplied him with his, all his school supplies. One white pad and a pen. I have my supplies, and I'm sitting in class with Alan, taking notes. I go home at night. I summarize them, catalog them, and so on. Alan, great doodler, all over this. One class, it was uh, adolescent psych. We're in the class, it started at nine, 10 minutes after he gives me the elbow, let's go for coffee. I said, go for coffee? I gotta know what this guy's saying. Okay, so he continues doodling, gives me the elbow, five minutes later, let's go for coffee. He said, he just said the same thing three different ways. I didn't even know he said it once. <laughs> <clears throat> Another course, we walk in the first day, get a reading list. Now, summer school, as you know, is four weeks. And if it's a course that has a midterm, after two weeks you can write an exam, or if it doesn't, at the end of four weeks you write an exam. Anyways, it put the reading list out, and there was about, I don't remember, 10, 12 books on it. I recognized the title, because someone had mentioned the book. I had never read any of them. Alan had read them all. He says, this is ridiculous. He says, we're gonna go talk to this guy. So. Why? Why are we going to talk to this guy? This is a reading list. This is the course. So anyways, we go to the guy's office. Professor, a guy. Hey, I've been out of education too long. So we go to the prof's office, and Alan does all the talking, and I stay near the door behind him. <clears throat> and he explains to him, you know, he says, what is this? You know, we've, we've read all this. We've read all this. <laughs> um, <I> guess, <clears throat> anyways. Finally, the prof acquiesced. Alan's a smooth talker. He says, okay, take this book and this book, compare the different philosophies. Now, this is the Friday. Do you remember this, Alan? You better say yes. Because <laughs> if you contradict anything I say, those are alternate facts if they're coming from you. <laughs> but anyways, uh, <clears throat> so we get these two books, and he says, you write it. If you pass, uh, I'll correct it, write an essay, you guys are through. Do it together. Okay. So I think, oh, I got to read two books. So we go home. Monday, Alan's driving to Western from New Westminster. He says to me, here, read this. I said, what's this? It's about six or seven pages. He's written it. He's written the whole thing. He submits it. He submits it. Prof says it's wonderful. Maybe the easiest A I ever got in my life. <laughs> And I'm hearing some laughing, and I know for a fact that many of you students, if you hold university degrees, most of you, Alan owes part of that degree, because I know the number of you that got him to help you with this essays. Alan, you, you probably got 20 degrees by now, at least. <laughs> Anyways, that was the story of Western Washington with Alan. It was really a unique, unique experience. Alan comes across as an academic and a very bright fellow. And one time I'm going to say something tonight, and I won't admit in public any other time, and I've never said to Alan, and I'm serious now. In my life, I've met a lot of people, a lot of wonderful people, some very, very, very bright people. But I've met three exceptionally bright people. Alan's one of them. And he gets that aura across when you listen to him and talk to him almost any subject, art, history, whatever. No matter what the course was someone was taking, he could help them. And if we needed someone to take a course up that no one else wanted, Alan would pick it up and he would take it. Anyways, this academic, this graduate of Oxford, who came over here to raise the tone in the colony. <laughs> Prof.
probably doesn't tell you that he spent a summer with me and Bill Cole pounding sand on Spanish banks playing 952. Do you remember that, Alan? Monday through Friday, weather permitting. And if we were really energetic and got up early enough, we might stop at Little Budapest at Alma and Forth for breakfast or maybe for lunch. But we, it was educational. 9-5-2 is a tough game. It's a tough game. But anyways, that's Alan for you. <clears throat> Meeting Alan, I didn't realize <clears throat> what a party animal he can be. And this is the same guy who you graduates probably got a lecture from him about you spending too much money when it came down to graduation with the pre-grad and the pre-pre-grad and what you spent on the tux and on the limousine and on the gifts and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. I consider the party at university where, well, you just need a few drinks and a few people and that was a party. Alan's party, he lived in West Van in an area called Dunderave. Large apartment above a commercial enterprise. So after five, six o'clock, business were shut down. And he'd hold a party there. And he's a firm believer. He also taught religion. Most years he ever taught. And he it was a firm believer that when our Lord went to a party, he never drank Pepsi Cola. <laughs> so when you went to one of Alan's parties, I know it's coming as shock, there was a fair amount of alcohol. <laughs> but that wasn't the kicker. His parties had a live band. It wouldn't survive today, I don't think, with the noise level, but we sure had a great time, did we not? The Tui band, were they good? Were they good? Can't, it's hard to uh, not remember those wonderful times, Alan. And at one of those parties, his father came over. The only time I met his father, and you remember his, what he did with us? He led us in the song, Knees Up, Mother Brown. Do you remember that? A wonderful time. Anyways, <clears throat> Alan has, I told you about one of his laments. His other lament he used to tell us in the staff room, he says he'd come in and he had a short night and he had, and really, no one corrected more papers than Alan Charlton. He'd come in with a stack of essays that he probably got just the day before and he corrected them, stayed up as long as it needed to, to correct them. And his lament, in the, and this goes back several decades, was, he says, you know, if I'm going to die, he says, please, Lord, let me die before I correct the next batch of essays, <laughs> not after. <clears throat> Alan is generous to a fault. By the way, I'm winding down. I don't, this is, you said three minutes, and I'm what? If you used two? If you used two? Okay. Yeah. Uh, anyways, <clears throat> Alan is generous to a fault, generous with his time. No one on staff volunteered as often and as much as Alan for anything. And most things were things no one else wanted to do. And I know there's some administrators out there, but it doesn't have to be administrators, teachers. You know, staff meeting, principal says, I got this little thing and I'd like, I need two volunteers. And that's the time everyone drops the pen on the floor, sleeks down their chair, starts taking copious notes, or I guess in this day and age, tweeting or whatever. Anyways, Alan it was always the first to volunteer. Very, very generous. On staff, he was the one that led collections. Someone was having an anniversary, a birth, marriage, whatever. Alan was the one who got that going on staff. At the end of the year, as you, we are now drawing the end of a school year, I've been away so long, I think school still ends in June. Uh, <clears throat> At this time of the year in the spring, when everyone is tired, Alan would pick it up. Alan for years, I don't know how many in the end, 70, 
75, 80 plays, I don't know. And it used to be one musical, one what he calls straight plays. He said straight because people like me wouldn't understand if he said anything else. So anyways, two plays a year, as well as full teaching load. And then it became the spring one was a grad play. So when everyone was tired, what was Alan doing? He was directing a grad play, as well as teaching ballroom dancing to the grads and their escorts. Yeah, you're in it. You know, you know that's, someone once said, you take a, get a busy man and you need something done, ask a busy man. And that is the definition of, of Alan Charlton. And <clears throat> I don't know how many of you are vital, energetic members for the Teachers Association, but the CISVA has a Teachers Association. And it is through the work over the years of Alan Charlton, the Colleen Burnells, and a handful of people who would hold meetings that you could hold in a phone booth. He would hold them in his classroom at school here, and single digits would show up. Occasionally, they would grow to a little larger to what it is today. So it's people like Alan that is responsible for that. And a while ago, he mentioned to me, actually a few years ago now, uh, he was going to an alumni meeting, and he was excited. And I said, you know, haven't you given that up? I mean, he's the one also that was pushing the Alumni Association. He's the one who would make phone calls and start it going, and they would die. And they would go for a while, and they would die, and Alan was always there. But I know there's many, and that's very, very active compared to what it was in my day, right now, the Alumni Association. But I want the members to know what he thinks of it. He says to me, it's what keeps me young. He says, we spend the meetings laughing. And then I hear from Bruna tonight, she tells me, it's really a social outing, and I, I think there's some wine there too. <laughs> and, <clears throat> anyways, in conclusion, I'll say this. Alan is, without a doubt, not only one, as I said earlier, the most intelligent people I've ever met, he is one of the most generous, and it's even more important than both of those, he's a friend. And if you have Alan as a friend, you have a friend for life. Thank you. Principles and speeches, eh? Current staff know all about that anyways. <laughs> um, thank you, Phil. We might need to get the band up and then if the, the speakers go over three, more, three minutes, start playing like the Oscars and get louder and louder. <laughs> all right, Alan uh, made specific requests to the scope of this evening. One person per decade will speak. Unfortunately, Alan, Moses sends his regrets. <laughs> but we'll start with the 1960s. Leah Lindsay was one of Alan's first students in his first homeroom in 1964. Alan claims he tried to teach her something new every year. He failed miserably. Therefore, she, com she compensated by becoming a teacher. Welcome to the podium, please, Ms. Leah Lindsay. Good evening, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Good. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and Alan, it's an honor that you asked me to say a few words. Ha, huh. not likely. Um, I th always knew I was one of your best students, Alan, and now I know I was your favorite. So it didn't hurt that my family lived right across the street from Notre Dame, where Alan spent many dinners and became a beloved member of our family. I was also, as already mentioned, um, a brand new grade eight student the very first year that Alan started teaching at Notre Dame. I was so excited, no more tunic and knee socks, little pleated skirt, 
and I was sitting very first. Are you sure you can hear me? Wave. Okay. I was sitting in my desk chatting with the person next to me when this very weird looking nun in a suit walked towards me. I immediately jumped on my hands, having been fresh out of Catholic elementary school, I was waiting for the ruler to descend. When the weird looking nun gave me a great big smile and said, keep chatting, Alan, thank you. That was the permission I'd been waiting for and I haven't stopped since. <laughs> so Alan taught us religion, French, and English. Um, and Alan was really concerned that we learn critical thinking skills, not just regurgitate information. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I remember one particular class. We'd been doing Shakespeare for a couple of weeks, so specifically Othello. And yeah, I guess we were yawning and filing our nails. Um, when Alan said, <sighs> Othello is symbolic of Jesus Christ. What do you think about that? Well, we all kind of looked at each other and said, oh, yeah, I guess that sounds right. Okay. And Alan jumped to his feet and said, that's bloody rubbish. And you're nothing but a bunch of contented cows. <laughs> well, needless to say, we were really insulted, but it did spur some of us on to actually read the play, if not the Coles Notes version. <laughs> so who can forget the endless hours of play practices? Ellen, we probably would have been out on the streets smoking, drinking, and doing drugs. If it weren't for you, we saved all that for university. <laughs> Many nights and many pizzas. And speaking of play practices, I guess, Ellen, I've always kind of wondered why I never got a leading part. And I was always relinquished to being the wardrobe mistress. Uh, I mean, I might have been the next Meryl Streep. <laughs> Instead, I went into teaching. So, and then who can forget uh, is anybody here, a few of you old enough to remember the horrible provincial exams that we, that we had to take no matter how good our marks were? Alan spent weeks firing questions at us. Um, again, more pizzas. Who, who could have thought studying could be so much fun? Actually. Speaking of firing things, I was going to mention that, Alan, I'm so grateful you went into teaching because I don't know how many of you know that Alan could have been a professional baseball player, particularly a pitcher. Because Alan could fire a chalk brush or a piece of chalk <laughs> across the room and hit his intended target. And those were the days of the big beehive hairdos. So many of us occasionally when we washed our hair out, you know, found some really interesting pieces of chalk. Okay, so when it came to graduation, and I think I mentioned Alan spent hours and hours with us working through, firing questions at us. I'll always remember, Ellen, what you wrote in my yearbook. It meant, I, and I know you're not the sentimental type, but this meant a whole lot to me. Ellen wrote, Dear Leah, it's been a joy from basement to bayshore. And I will miss you, love, Alan. And that just really touched me. That wasn't a stamp, was it? <laughs> okay, because I have, uh, Alan, we love you and appreciate 
everything that you have done for us. Um, and being a teacher myself, I, I really want to share one little quick teaching experience. I worked with a young man for six years. Um, he was extremely challenging. And um, when he finally graduated, much to the relief of the whole building, he shoved a bunch of dead flowers at me with the endearing words, now whose life are you going to make miserable? <laughs> of course, nobody will ever be saying that about you, Alan. <laughs> and Alan, our relationship Alan, it did not end after grad. Obviously, I mentioned that Alan was part of our family. We, he came to dinner. Um, he was always part of Christmas and Easter, but um, Alan held his famous dinners, you know, the ones with five courses and four decadent desserts. And some of my most beloved friends today, um, you know, oh, you graduate and you go in different directions, but those dinners brought us together and kept us in contact. And I, I think my life would be so different. I can't imagine my life without having them in it. Alan, I hope you'll remember that satisfaction when you're, you know, in line at the food bank. Um, but I have, I want you to know I have a plan. I know there's a bit of apprehension around your retirement, but I have a plan. I, I haven't done the math very well, but that's not your fault. That would be Phil or Al's. Um, because my math sucks. But anyways, here is my plan. Um, if even a quarter of the students that you have had over the years takes you on an outing once a year, we can probably keep you busy every day until you're at least 100. <laughs> and... And just so you know, I'm serious. I'm starting up a collection for the wheelchair accessible van. <laughs> in, in the event the handy dart is not available. <laughs> and I really hope that at the very least, Notre Dame is going to put up a statue or at least, at least a blow up balloon, Alan Charlton. <laughs> we love you, Alan. <laughs> So we'll take a quick break before the next speaker. Please enjoy some, uh, some food and um, you can help yourself to some beverages. Thank you.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to keep the night going here. So I ask for your attention, please. Shh. All right, Joriana. Pardon me, Alan? Okay, <laughs> so our next guest, Joriana Temelo, was cast in Alan's recent play, alumni play, The Unexpected Guest, in November. You may recognize Doriana, who recently retired from a successful career in journalism, working for Global. <laughs> and um, hopefully being a journalist, she understands the importance of time, because we'll cut to commercial if she goes over three minutes. When she was in grade 12, she played the lead role of stage manager in Our Town, Ms. Doriana Temelo. And it, uh, may I be the first to say from the stage, great outfit. Love the outfit. <laughs> and yes, Joe, because I'm not a teacher, I know what three minutes is. <laughs> so I, I actually will keep to that time. So when I first met Alan in grade eight at the age of 12, I never dreamed of the impact that he would have on my life and how he would influence my career choice. If he hadn't taught me, would I have gone into reporting? I'm not so sure. English was my second language, but Alan opened up my eyes to the opportunities of journalism as a career, where I worked for the next four decades. In his English class, he reminded us that every good story has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and that good writing is more than more about turning a phrase than using a lot of big words or flowery sentences. It is still intimidating putting anything in writing in front of him all these years later. I became a news director of a national newscast and I still agonize over copy that he will see as if I'm in grade nine again. <laughs> reminded of Alan every day in my everyday life, one of my security questions to recover a password asks favorite teacher. Well, after telling you this, I guess I'll have to change it from Mr. Charlton. Mr. Charlton. Couldn't be Alan, not until maybe a couple of years ago, but <laughs> up until then I had to be Mr. Charlton. And if I had to guess, I'm pretty sure one of Alan's passwords is Rosebud because he's famously seen Citizen Kane, his favorite movie, 123 times. He's actually used that number, 123. Theater and film are the other passions of Alan's life, and we as students benefited. In the 70s, long before streaming movies, video on demand, and Netflix, we had the Notre Dame Film Festival. And Alan arranged for us to see some classic movies we might never have seen otherwise. And I still appreciate On the Waterfront. <laughs> That was old, yeah. That was even before our time. Just to point that out, it wasn't current. It was before our time. <laughs> and of course, Alan did, as will be noted by many people, directed dozens and dozens of school productions. Our entire grad class, our entire class, think of the scope of that. We were over 100 students, was in our grade 12 musical, My Fair Lady. I was way, way back, because it was a musical and you didn't want me anywhere near the front. <laughs> For some reason, while I can still remember my computer, what I have trouble remembering my computer passwords, I can still recite some passages from Shakespeare that Alan made us memorize. Out, out, damn spot. <laughs> and it is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Some of Alan's thousands and thousands of students, including my own daughter Justine, would agree there were occasional bouts of sound and fury, not to mention sarcasm and dry humor in his classes, <laughs> but his teachings, his influence, signified a great deal in so many lives. 
Congratulations, Alan. We all wish you a very long and happy retirement. Oriana. Nick Altieri and Alan share a passion for fine dining. Perhaps too much of a passion that squandered Alan's retirement funds. <laughs> Alan's proudest achievement in this friendship is converting Nick from a Coca-Cola drinker to an expensive wine drinker. Please welcome Mr. Nick Altieri. Good evening everyone. My name is Nick Altieri. I'm part of the grad class of 1998. Just to give everyone some context, that was already during a time when there were whispers of whether or not Charlton would be hanging them up. Actually, now that I think about it, they probably were more like prayers. <laughs> and kids hoping that they can escape the wrath of Alan Charlton as their grade 12 English teacher. Anyway, at that point, uh, being he was in his early 60s at the time. By most of our standards in this room, Alan would have already had a fairly um, successful career, at least in terms of time served. Of course, that wasn't the case. Alan at that point went on to teach now 20 more years since being my grade 12 English teacher and grade 11 career, uh, sorry, uh, career counselor. Now, a few months ago, when Al politely asked me, or at least as politely as Al can ever ask, he says, Nick, I'd like you to speak at my retirement. <laughs> but you have to keep it short. You only have three minutes. And because there's going to be other speakers. Okay, Al, I, I understand. So like my English teacher, Al delivered the assignment and says exactly what he wants. So I said to him, Al, I don't even need three minutes. I only need 30 seconds to tell everybody, everybody what kind of a miserable asshole you've been. <laughs> now, some of you have to agree. Some of you have to agree. There's some truth to this. Alan was feared by generations of students at, that he was, they were going to have him as his English 12 teacher. And, Faculty, and even some of you here probably feared Alan as an English 12 teacher. And faculty, you would also, some of you at least, uh, would agree, and I know that even the ones that aren't here for sure would agree, that Alan on occasion had a difference of opinion with people. <laughs> Only on occasion, on occasion, let me highlight occasion, okay? But I'm sure everybody here would agree that Alan was always able to come to a compromise and smooth things over with his English charm. <laughs> charm and compromise and Alan Charlton in the same sentence. Anyway, there's some degree of truth in those last statements, but I'll leave it to you to figure out where. <laughs> now, despite his crusty character, as he was once so, in my opinion, eloquently described by a government teacher evaluator years ago. His often unorthodox teaching style, which I'll remind you, as somebody mentioned already, uh, involved yelling and screaming at the top of his lungs and cursing at students and throwing things across the room, was actually quite effective. I think some of you would agree that he brought the best out of every single one of us and likely thousands more. I'll give you an example of one of my experiences with Al when, in this teaching style. It would have been actually probably our, likely our first meeting um, where he was my uh, grade 11 career counselor. Al whips into the room, because anybody who knows Al, he's always moving quick, and says, Altieri, what do you want to do with yourself when you graduate? I said, I don't know, Mr. Charlton. I think I'd like to be a physiotherapist. Well, can you get A's, he says to me. I'm, I'm not sure. Well, you better figure it out. And he walked out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> now, I tell you that story because I believe the moral of that story is that Alan motivated and pushed all of us to challenge our boundaries. And along the way, he helped us to achieve our, or helped us with our personal achievements. 
I actually think Alan's greatest legacy as a teacher is his ability to develop communities. Um, his, he was able to develop communities inside the classroom as an English teacher, but in my opinion, more importantly and effectively, he was able to develop communities outside of the classroom, far outside these walls, um, and continues to do so where he's creating friendships with former students, um, friendships with their friends, uh, and even with their families. To the point where he's even considered by many as a mentor in some way, which I know uh, some of you here today uh, can attest to just like I can. And on a deeper level, um, I think Alan, uh, by many of you here, is considered part of the family. Um, just like we do in my family, um, which I think is a truly remarkable achievement for my grade 12 English teacher. Now, before I wrap up, when Alan wasn't able to teach you English, or when he wasn't able to teach you about, teach you about English literature, or if he couldn't teach you about community, Alan would say this. I can't teach stupid. <laughs> or he would say, I can't help it if you choose not to follow simple directions. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to at this time invite up Mike Blackstock from the Alumni Association for a special presentation. Hi everybody. Alan. Alan, on behalf of the Alumni Association, we'd just like to give you this small token of our appreciation and as a small bribe to continue to come to our meetings at Bruna's house and continue to bring those desserts that we all love so much. So thanks very much. I'll give this to you. I'll, I'll walk down there. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll take a quick break before our next set of speakers enjoy. Our next guest is, is one of our best dressed this evening as well, next to Alan, I would say. Maybe kind of looks like Alan tonight. Pietro played the lead in many Notre Dame productions, including the lead role of Michael Stark in Alan's alumni play this past year. When scripting these introductions, Alan informed me that on his advice, ladies and gents, alumni never change sometime, hey? Still talking. Thank you. But on Al uh, uh, thanks to Alan's advice, Pietro completed History 12 via correspondence with Alan as a tutor. Pietro spent a total of two hours with Alan that entire year and ended up with a 96% on the provincial exam, displaying how redundant of a teacher Alan was. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Pietro Ferrato. <laughs> Is he here? <laughs> Just thought. Thank you. Well, I've been given just a few minutes to speak about one of the people who I can honestly say has most impacted my life. Sometimes we need to be standing in public in order to tell someone that which we feel so personally and privately, which is how much that person has meant to us. And in preparing to do so, we suddenly realize we haven't said it for quite a while or said it enough. And this is one of those times. Alan was the first person to speak at my wedding. And now it's my turn to talk about him. And I realize that I am just one of so many individuals who has been touched by Alan. For we, all of us here, are the means by which Alan is able to be Alan. For it is through us that Alan extends the wonderful person that he is into the world around him. Alan, 
I found an article from 2003 when we did our alumni play Our Town, where you recounted having entered the seminary at 27. And there you said, quote, God didn't know a good thing when he had it. <laughs> he didn't want me to be a priest. Well, he may not have wanted you to be a priest, Alan, but he did know a good thing when he had it. And he gave that good thing to all of us. And in that same article, I was, and a few others were asked what we had to say about Alan. And I said, quote, you feel so lucky to have made such a bond with somebody. To have had you in my life, Alan, has been an immense blessing. You started as my teacher, but you became my friend. And I know that each person here tonight has a friend in you. I first met Alan by auditioning for the Christmas musical Scrooge in grade 11. For me, Alan was that magical person in this magical place at that magical time in life. That time when you come each day to these fun and familiar surroundings at an age where all your life is still before you, full of dreams and hopes, and anything seems possible. And then along comes Alan. <laughs> it really does show that you never, ever know when someone so special is just waiting around the corner, ready to enter your world and leave you forever changed. Meeting Alan and having him become my friend altered my trajectory. That year I had already chosen my course load heavy in math and sciences, expecting to pursue the very sensible field of engineering as my first degree. But getting to know Alan is how I got to know myself. It was Alan who encouraged me to take a really good long look in the mirror and decide if the studies I was planning to pursue really did speak truthfully to the person that I am, deep inside. He saw in me something which I now know to be the most defining part of me. And that until I met Alan, had remained largely locked away. And he was right to have me stop and rethink. I shifted towards the arts, including my favorite classes that were taught by him. I developed such a love of the written and spoken word, appreciating so many wonderful works of poetry and literature, all forms of art, architecture, and even introducing me to different composers and works of music. And most of all, directing me on that stage. That magnificent stage where you can become anyone. For me, that love of acting and performing and the memories of Alan's productions both in high school and as an alumnus are among the most joy-filled and moving experiences of my life. And so it was in becoming lost in these arts because of Alan that I found out more about who I was. All that came from Alan was shared so generously, signing me up for and coaching me for a poetry recital for a festival of the spoken arts, teaching me History 12 on his own time because I already had a full course load, helping me develop academically and especially to apply my diligence to writing, and assisting me with my work later on in university. My academic success and most of all the love of learning that I developed, I attribute to you, Alan. He made me believe in myself. And so many firsts in my life I experienced through you, taking me to my first symphony, first opera, first ballet, first musical, numerous films, and so many meals that you and I enjoyed. All things that you introduced me to. And while the years do go by, 
And with all of life's other demands, it can become harder and harder to find the time to continue nurturing and cultivating this part of you. But the fact is, you don't have to be regularly doing something in order for that something to be a permanent and defining part of who you are. And in my life, for me, the person that I am and how I see the world came so much to me through all of what Alan shared with me. And that is the gift that you gave me, Alan. And when I see Alan, I'm reminded of all that special time in life you may say you're old, Alan, but when we're with you, you bring us back and you make us feel so young again. But really, what I experienced and learned with Alan, more than all these things, and the most important thing, is just what it is to be a wonderful human being and all the beauty in life that can be shown to you by someone who cares. What we think of and remember most in life is people and the feelings that they give us. And in Alan, I got to know a human being who cared enough to spend time with me and talk to me and to help me discover myself. He became and remains my dear friend. In that 2003 article, Alan, you spoke of what you call, quote, quiet heroism. The people who do what they do and keep society going. Well, you are one of those heroes to us. When I last saw you a week ago, today, you said times had changed, that you're no longer relevant, and it's time that you should now call it a day. But Alan, your significance to us remains and is one that will continue to echo in our lives for years to come. And whenever it's my turn to be in your shoes, sometime later in life, when I'll be reflecting on it all, you will be one of the people who I most remember. We love you, Alan, and we thank you for loving us in return. Thank you, Piero. Our next speaker is Alan's most recent graduate speaker, graduating last year. His flair of sarcasm, wit, and kindness is a recipe for success at one of Alan's esteemed dinner parties. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jeremy Wong. Good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me? No one can hear me? Hear me? Good, good. All right, as Joe said, my name's, jo uh, my name's Jeremy Wong. I'm a graduate of the class of 2016. Alan has asked me to speak on behalf of my generation, the millennials. When you think of the millennials, the first thing that comes to mind is usually lazy, self-entitled, and not what they used to be. <laughs> Alan went through a lot of red ink and a lot of unkind words to make sure we remember that. <laughs> and though these traits were frustrating for him, I don't think they were the biggest challenges he'd have to face in the classroom. To keep us engaged, he'd have to introduce technology. That way, we'd be up to the times, and he would as well. Because the rise of cell and smartphones has dramatically changed the teaching environment, Alan has had to compete with text messages, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, all of which constantly vie for the student's attention. I can proudly say that Alan no longer uses VCRs in the classroom. <laughs> he does use the computer for showing movies, videos, and such, but it's not all bright. He struggles with changing the volume, and we were very lucky if we ever got to see a video in full screen. <laughs> but despite all these distractions, Alan has found a way in all of his classes, especially English, to teach. Yes, he was tough. You'll hear from a lot of former students that you really had to work for the marks 
and that a lot of them, some of them don't really like him. But disregard that. I think his most important connection with, our millennial, with the millennials, my age group, is, his, is in his teaching doctrine. Drawn from a quote, one of his favorite quotes from the 1965 film A Thousand Clowns, which features an unemployed uncle trying to retain custody over his orphan nephew. He argues to the child services employee, I just want him to stay with me until I can be sure he, weren't, he won't turn into nothing. I want him to get to know exactly the special thing he is, or else he won't notice when it starts to go. I want him to stay awake and know who the phonies are. I want him to know how to holler and put up an argument. I want a little guts to show before I can let him go. I want to be sure he sees all the wild possibilities. And I want him to know the subtle, sneaky, important reason why he was born a human being and not a chair. <laughs> this is what Alan has tried to do for every student that has walked through his doors. For us millennials, the self-centered, uninformed, and indifferent millennials, I think this quote, this doctrine, speaks the highest praise of Alan's character. He has unrelentingly tried to help each of his students find his or her own identity. His determination, his vigor, and his dedication to teach every student whether or not they want it to be is something to be inspired by and is something that I will surely never forget. So, on behalf of the millennials, Alan, thank you for all that you have done and for showing us that subtle, sneaky, and important reason again and again and again. And we wish you all the best in your retirement. Thank you. So uh, we'll take a quick break and then we'll hear from uh, Stephanie Chan and the man himself. She's our final speaker this evening who will be, spe who are, who will be doing a tribute towards Ellen. <laughs> Stephanie Chan met Ellen while she was completing her practicum at Notre Dame. Ellen knew Stephanie was talented and when she was hired on staff, <laughs> ladies and gents, where's Father Richard? Alan knew Stephanie was talented and when she was hired on staff, Alan had confidence in Stephanie's commitment to improve the English department in her role as department head at Notre Dame. Please welcome fellow Notre Dame staff member, Ms. Stephanie Chan. Good evening. Alan likes to introduce me to his friends as his boss, but we all know that no one tells Alan what to do. He just does it. And what hasn't he done for his students, this school, and the friends who are his de facto family? For someone so obviously of English extraction, the man has certainly acquired a lot of Italian relations. <laughs> While I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you all in person, after years of listening to Alan recount the enviable details of his incredibly full social calendar, I feel as though I sort of know you already, or ought to anyway. Now, if you spent any appreciable amount of time in conversation with Alan, you might be under the mistaken impression that the man doesn't like his job very much. <laughs> Nonsense. Just think. Even though his reviews for the BC Catholic would suggest that pretty much every movie made in the last century is an unmitigated disaster, <laughs> sitting through all that mediocrity hasn't turned him off of cinema entirely, has it? Well, why should a couple hundred thousand pages of utterly unremarkable student writing be reason to abandon the entire educational enterprise? On the contrary, the worse the essays get, the more essential the teacher becomes. Alan Charlton will not be defeated by misplaced commas, incomprehensible spelling, constantly shifting tenses, the upteenth original composition featuring that dreaded trifecta of favored teen topics, drugs, death, and drama. No, not of the Shakespearean sort. 
If you think Charlton would let ignorance and stupidity stand for a minute, you obviously haven't been paying attention, which is probably why Alan's still here 52 years later. <laughs> Not having ever been formally taught by Mr. Charlton myself, I can't say I have any horror stories or battle scars to share, but I can tell you one or two things I've picked up about teaching from Alan over the years. We all know teacher education programs don't cover essentials, like when to turn your back on a bunch of 10th graders, never, or how to unjam the photocopier two minutes before the first spell on the Tuesday after a long weekend with a line of other teachers watching. But what I've gotten from Alan has been far more indispensable than the wherewithal to survive high school as a young teacher on the other side of the trenches. Crusty old Alan, as he likes to fashion himself, has shown me more than anyone else how to find joy in being here, day in, day out, so that being here for the long haul doesn't feel like work, but the kind of inexhaustible challenge that one for whom boredom and tedium really would be death gladly lives for. It doesn't matter how long you've been in the classroom, you keep learning and wanting to learn, even if that means doing the new curriculum in the final leg of your tenure. You love your colleagues and chastise them when necessary. And the best of what you do and who you are doesn't change at the final bell on the last day of the school year, not even at the apparent denouement of a whole life's work. Alan would be the first to say that age does not automatically confer wisdom. Who cares? The teacher we remember isn't the sage on the stage, but the one who worked harder for our success than perhaps even we ever did. Not because it was his job and he had to, but because it was his calling and he chose to. The man is nothing if not generous. Chaucer will probably roll over in his grave tonight, and Alan can blast me tomorrow for subjecting you to more than my allotted three minutes and terrible scansion to boot, but I'll take one for the team to give him proper dues. So if you indulge me a little longer for this retrospective and this salute. To Canada there came a man from Poole who'd read at Oxford, so he was no fool. They needed one who'd teach, and thus he stayed, from seminary by this call conveyed, instead to know, love, serve at Notre Dame. Methinks you know him, Alan is his name. In search of coffee, whatever else befalls, he'd venture forth with mug to brave the halls. How many mornings spent he talking shop with Brassington, a fresh pot, George and Bob. To young years, he delivered such candor, his caustic wit and blistering splendor. Trust Alan Charlton, he will speak his mind. To one and all, Roger no less in kind. Perchance like many, you've had the pleasure of getting the butt end of a censure. Did he compel you read a book or two, sometime before your year at school was through? Still see your meager pages bleeding red? Hear Mr. Charlton loudly in your head. They don't learn a thing, oft I hear him say. All they care about is that bloody play. Nevertheless, in spite of life and all, some lessons even recalcitrants recall, and think so fondly of surviving class, they forget who just squeaked by with a pass. The parents were no better than their kids, I could never get them to shut their lids. Oh, horror the grammar, our smartphones to blame. The more things change, the more they stay the same. A different suit had he for every day. He didn't stay with teaching for the pay, who does? But for the all-important task of setting young minds straight, whether they ask, the sneaky, subtle reason they were born, a human being, not a chair forlorn. There was and is a life worth living well, sans social media, those myths dispel. 
and possession of skills commensurate with one who is computer literate. Did Alan teach himself to double space, more than some kids can do in any case, to ask Google to cite MLA style, to blog and watch YouTube once in a while? Will this octogenarian never quit? I doubt it very much. The man's got grit. For teacher pensions, he stuck out his neck. A new school bus came from his birthday trek. To see him direct again one last show, alumni crammed like kids into each row. Come trivia night, find him front and center at the CEC, engaged in banter. Yes, fulls his calendar in general with weddings, baptisms, and funerals. For grads, no matter how old, know his face. He is the heart and soul of this fine place. If ever there were names that he forgot, don't hold him responsible for the lot, but judge the man by those who call him friend, would e'en their future offspring to him send, a crusader of things academic, to crustiness, this last panegyric. At your retirement, we should shed no tears. Good was the work of two and fifty years. Now commences labor much more trying, days on end without some essay marking. Never run out of invitations to dine. Look forward you to imbibing more wine. Waste not a thought on the next prodi day. You'll be on perpetual holiday. The teacher retires, the juggler remains. Thus life makes room for life without complaints. What words in parting if he had the mic? Of these, half I don't know as I should like, and like less than half, half as you deserve. So might he say with characteristic verve. And as a hobbit did, bid fond farewell. That's it. What's left I leave others to tell. No, not tales of a perfect gentle night, but a singular steady stalwart light, which neither time nor age could diminish. To Alan Charlton, this most fervent wish, toss out those red pens, but do what you do. Teach lazy retirement a thing or two. And if it should disregard instruction, raise some hell in demanding perfection. How's this for consolation, my dear friend? No rest for the wicked, tis not an end. Now raise your glass together, one and all, to Alan, who'll have an absolute ball. Before we ask Alan to speak, I, um, I'm going to ask for the four strongest men in the room, currently strong, not back in 67. <laughs> We're actually going to move the piano onto the stage because we have a performance this evening. So if I can get four or five guys to just come and help Mr. Ishwood here at the front. Don't be shy. Thousand pound club. There we go. Benji, where are you at? Our final speaker is a brilliant man whom we are celebrating this evening. Alan, you came to Notre Dame in 1964. It's 2017. Your dedication to our school community extends beyond the classroom. Two years ago on your 80th birthday, when we should have been celebrating you, you chose to complete a walkathon and fundraise more than $44,000 towards our new school bus. I would like everyone to please put your hands together as we welcome the man of the hour, or the last five and a half decades, Mr. Alan Charlton. Shut up! I hope I can get through this, but I do ask you to be patient if I can't. And just in case I can't make it to the end, let me right away say thank you to all of you for coming. 
I must admit that honestly, I didn't think more than a handful of people would show up. <laughs> really? I mean, why, why would you? I'm so pleasantly surprised, indeed shocked, that so many of you have. I'm sure you could all have found much better things to do on a Friday evening. I just hope you've enjoyed reuniting with others. Of course, as I look back over 52 years at Notre Dame, hundreds of memories come crowding in. As I remember the little school on Parker Street that I came to in 1964. It has changed from a rather tired looking old building with 375 students to the wonderful structure in which we meet tonight with a student population almost exactly twice as big, some 750 students. Thanks to all those whose fidelity to Notre Dame made the new building and the growth in population possible. We owe them a lot. Over 52 years, we've come from a staff of 13, three men and, two, and 10 nuns, not 17, Phil, uh, to a staff of almost 60. I want to give a special shout out to one woman here, Sandra Patrick, are you back there still? Sandra, uh, who as Miss Potier was, as she proudly proclaims, the first slave woman staff member in 1965. Since then, the... <laughs> Since then, of course, the balance has changed quite a bit, uh, which is the way it should be. After all, this is 2017. And by the way, I think I wish to thank tonight's speakers for helping to bring back so many memories. Though having listened to their comments, I'm not sure about the thanks. I asked them to speak because I thought they were my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless of their entirely unjustified insults, I do thank them for the comments, for the compliments they managed to fit in. However, they have said enough about the past and I certainly don't want to talk about the future. To start with, I find it almost impossible to envisage what retirement is going to be like. After being in the classroom for 55 years, I have no idea how to live any other life. This doesn't frighten me, but as a result, my bucket list is, is short enough that I'm hoping I can complete it. It consists of only two items. For the month of July, I plan to travel for the fourth summer in a row with my wonderful great nephew, Josh. We're traveling in England, Russia, and Portugal. When I return to Vancouver at the beginning of August, I intend to get a dock. If you know where I can get a Border Collie Poodle Cross, please let me know. <laughs> They're hard to get, apparently. Other than that, I look forward to a future with no essays to mark, no report cards to complete, and above all, thanks, and I'm going to miss the new curriculum. So that's it. That's my bucket list. As I say, I don't want to spend my time now talking about past events or thinking of the future. I don't suppose that at 82 there's a lot of future left anyway, but rather to express my gratitude. I have mentioned how delighted I am that so many of you made the effort to come this evening Though, now that I've begun speaking, I'm not sure if you will be equally delighted. Let me explain why. As you all know, I'm a person who never questions anything uh, <laughs> and rarely talks very much. However, on this one occasion, I'm just, just for once going to take the liberty of being a talkative nonconformist. The first piece of advice I was given tonight is that it would be proper to keep my remarks brief. Now, as I've said, you all know me as a man of very few words, but I hope you will understand that it's rather hard to be brief about 52 years if I'm going to do my feelings justice. As to length, well, you better make sure you've got a drink in your hand. You're going to need it. I might almost be as long as Phil. I suppose the first thing I want to say about my years at Notre Dame is that in a very obvious way, as other speakers have said this evening, Notre Dame has become my family, and you're all part of that family. 
But if you will allow me, I want here to change metaphors. So God knows, after half a century of trying, I despair of teaching any of you what a metaphor is. <laughs> Despite that, I would like to compare my years at Notre Dame to the weaving of a tapestry. Many years ago, back in the dark ages when I was in secondary school, we studied the Industrial Revolution and I learned about the impact it had on the weaving industry. One thing I learned was the difference between the warp and the woof. In weaving, the warp refers to the vertical threads and the woof to the horizontal. Well, in my years at Notre Dame, there proved to be both warp and woof, which together has made up the tapestry of my life. There are many people whom I must thank for this. First of all, I give thanks to God and to Our Lady of Lourdes, who have blessed me so richly. Sixty years ago, in 1957, almost to the day, actually, I think the anniversary was three days ago, I became a Catholic. I finished my studies at Oxford, and a few weeks later, I emigrated to Vancouver, intent on raising the tone of the colonies. <laughs> All of that in 1964 led me, by a series of flukes, to Notre Dame. Of course, at that time, I didn't realize I was sentencing myself to 52 years of trying vainly to teach students such difficult things as how to spell receive, definitely, unfortunately, and the difference between it's with a comma apostrophe and it's without one. <laughs> if I'd only known what was in store, I'd have probably passed on by. As it is, I am glad I stopped. However, at this point, I wish to surrender in one regard. I give up. I resign myself to the fact that the abuse of the English language will remain a constant no matter how hard teachers try to stop it, and many of my former students are intent on proving this. <laughs> but it's not been disappointing entirely, far from it. As a result of coming to Notre Dame, the greatest blessing I received was that I have had the joy and pleasure of knowing hundreds of colleagues, friends, and associates and thousands of students, including all of you here tonight. These people have been the woof, the horizontal threads that cross my life on a daily basis. But they were set against the warp, the vertical thread of a special group of parents. For from the beginning of my career here at the school, many parents provided the structure against which we embroidered our lives. And once again, I'm going to surprise all of you. Even though you know me to be a person who never steps out of line and who always does what he's told, for the second time tonight, I am going to act independently by going against the advice of others, something I rarely do. I'm going to name some parents special to me. I've been warned that afterwards someone's going to come up to me and say, you forgot my parents. So if I do, let me say in advance that I am sorry. However, it wouldn't be right for the evening to pass without acknowledging the deep and long-lasting friendship of so many parents who have welcomed me into their homes and their family circles and truly made Notre Dame a family experience. Indeed, these parents became as close in friendship as their children. Sadly, many of them have passed on. Fortunately, some are here tonight. At this time, I just want in no particular order, publicly, to thank the following. Some of the names will mean something to some of you. All of the names mean a lot to me. Leo and Annette Cesarini, Dart and Bede Stenner, Bill and Bev, Bev DeVest, John and Ida Grant, Steve and Inez Diakow, Norb and Flo Doyle, Mirko and Maria Bajic, Joe and Maria Longkarich, Bob and Florence Cruikshank, Reg and Eve Stott, Sharon Fraser, Fernando and Maria Moretto, Alfonso and Assunta Zavolisi, Mike and Ann Krillick, Jerry and Carol Franco, John and Penny Engelman, Tony and Anne Altieri, Victor and Maria Sira, Marie and Errol Wong, and Lena and Peter Zanada. They have not only entrusted their kids to my gentle, patient, and kind instruction, 
but have welcomed me into their homes on numerous occasions at Christmas and New Year's, at Easter, on birthdays, and indeed whenever the family was celebrating. They not only included me, but even thanked me for coming. They had become my family within a family. I had to recognize them. As I say, if I forgot anyone, please put it down to my senility. I'm sure that won't be difficult, especially for those of you who have regarded me as senile for the last 50 years. <laughs> but of course, there has been a multitude of other wonderful parents, parents who might get to know less well, yet who have also been incredibly supportive. I've bumped into them in a variety of places. Less predictably, Las Vegas, London, and Rome. More predictably, locally, at church, at restaurants, at Costco, at Bose's, at Chofi's, Renzulo's Grocery, Bianca Maria's. Always these parents have been gracious and welcoming. What is remarkable is not only are so many of them Italian, Croatian, Filipino, whatever, but they even forgave me for being English. <laughs> As a result, I've always been made to feel that my life has been played out in an enormous and ever-expanding family. Considering that I have absolutely no blood family here, I'm an orphan, my life it could have been an empty and lonely one. As it is, I've been enriched beyond measure. So thank you to all the Notre Dame parents, those present and those absent, for the warp of the tapestry of my life. Then, a huge, of course, a huge part of the woof, the crossroads of the tapestry, has been the students. Of them, there are far too many to mention individually. Almost all of them I remember fondly, though I do want to take a moment at this time to apologize to a group that is not here. Many of you have been polite enough to say that I was an adequate teacher, but I also know that I've been a failure as a teacher for many of my students. Hard as some of you may find it to believe, many have hated their experience in my classroom. I know that no one can be all things to all people, but I do sincerely regret having offended some, having been inadequate to others, and having, in some cases, earned their undying disgust. I can only say I'm truly sorry I let them down. I sincerely wish that as their teacher I'd done things differently. Fortunately, there are some of you who have managed to endure my instruction and forgiven me my shortcomings as you shared in the quiet calm of my classes and relaxed at my meek and gentle approach, we got to know each other well. You have, in thousands of classes and in many activities, most especially stage productions, been an enormous factor in motivating me to stay at Notre Dame. Many of you have become lifelong and very close and cherished friends. I've even had the privilege of attending your weddings, the baptisms, confirmations, and weddings of your children. In some cases, you even let them be registered in my classes. I guess you were working on the principle that if you had to go through it, so should they. <laughs> what is most important to me is you've been gracious enough to include me in your lives outside of school and have been an important part of making Notre Dame a family experience for me. And just to let you know, there was life before Notre Dame. Uh, one of my students from grade seven at St. Anthony's West Vancouver, the T Terry O'Neill back there, but he did have the sense to marry a grad from Notre Dame. So. <laughs> um, and I want especially to thank one young gentleman who braved tonight, Lorenzo Bernardo. It was so nice that a current student came. It shows that not all is bad, even though the rest of them aren't here. So that speaks volumes. Thank you, students, for contributing to the tapestry of my life. While even I would not be so foolish to single out any students, it would be most wrong of me to let this evening go by without acknowledging one particular group of former Notre Dame students, most of whom I talked. They've already been mentioned this evening, but they are very special the alumni executive. Not only I, but all of you owe a huge debt to Laurie Marconato, Bruna Pizzolato, Diane Borovich, Lana Tesson, Eva Zanato, Mike Blackstock, Sue Cirillo, Joe Dardano, Steppy Blesch, Jeremy Wong, and Victor Sira. 
Some of them have worked for 20 years to keep the Alumni Association to get together to continue to fundraise for the school. If you're not aware of it, the beautiful stained glass windows in our new chapel were paid for by the alumni. They send out the newsletter and they operate the annual trivia night. Bruna especially, who hosts all our meetings and even gives me dinner prior to the meetings, thank you Bruna, uh, have proved tireless in keeping us all on track. And I want to let you into a secret. The alumni executive have also taught me that meetings can not only be productive, but they can also be a heck of a lot of fun. Maybe the wine has something to do with that. <laughs> Uh, but, just in case you think we're misappropriating, misappropriating alumni funds, let me assure you that we provide our own. We all know it will result in joyous deliberations, not many decisions, and several hours of socializing. If you really want to have a great time, then I urge any of you alumni to join the alumni executive. I guarantee you won't regret it. And if you don't join the executive, at least make sure you register your email address so that we can send you the newsletter. I've had so many people tell me, I don't get the newsletter anymore. That's because you didn't send us your email. <laughs> Despite the fact that for years everybody complained that we were using hard copy and why don't you go on to email? Well, you've just shown us why. Um, <laughs> And even if you can't find your way to doing this incredibly difficult task of leaving your email over on the table there, uh, at least come to Trivia Night. You might even, by the way, if you join the alumni membership, stop being so cheap, send us your $10 membership. Uh, it wouldn't be a Catholic evening if we didn't ask for money. I repeat that February the 27th is trivia night. Mark it down on those bloody devices that I'm always taking away from the kids so that you don't forget February the 27th, trivia night. I know you'll have fun if you come. I expect to see you there. And while I speak of alumni, I wish also to acknowledge another special group of the alumni, the alumni who made it possible for me to put on several alumni productions. They were great fun and truly rewarding. Further adding to the woof of the tapestry of my 52 years at Notre Dame, there have been my many colleagues. And this includes, sadly, many with whom I worked in the Teachers Association and some of whom are here uh, passed on, but some of here, uh, many of whom are here tonight. My colleagues have been invariably supportive, generous and forgiving, and above all, patient. I've been frequently asked what most I will miss about Notre Dame. I've already told them this at a staff meeting, but I want publicly to acknowledge them now. Students come and go, but many of my colleagues have tolerated for many more years than I reasonably could expect. They have supported me when most I needed it. They helped me when I tried in vain to manage technology. And my daily interaction with them is what I will most miss as I go off into lonely retirement. Thanks especially too to my workroom buddies, male and female. And guys, good luck with the dating. You'll need it. It is good to know that after I leave, there will be a valiant band of teachers who will continue to work tirelessly for their Notre Dame students. Parents can certainly send their children to the school confident that nowhere is there a more dedicated, hardworking, enthusiastic, and generous group of teachers than those at Notre Dame. And they didn't pay me to say that. Thank you, my cherished colleagues. At the same time, I wish to acknowledge my several principals. Sister Margaret Therese, Sister Martina Marie, Sister Catherine Nickerson, who actually phoned me earlier this evening, uh, Al Blesch, Phil Ledoux, Mike Cook, and Roger Delaurier. Those of you who have not had me on your staff will probably find it almost impossible to believe, but there are actually times when my presence can be a little awkward. Uh, indeed, there is a sizable complaints file in the office with my name on it to prove this. In fact, 
Only the first of these principals really appreciated who I was, Sister Margaret Therese. She thought quite rightly that I could do no wrong. She regarded me as the fourth person of the Trinity. Uh, but, <laughs> but she only lasted a year. <laughs> Somehow the others didn't agree with her. However, they too have been forgiving, patient, and miraculously, none of them have fired me, though I'm sure that all of them at many times would have liked to have done so. I'm also sure that Roger is giving thanks that I didn't drop dead in the classroom. I think, <laughs> I think I might make the last three weeks. So thank you to my bosses for letting me stay as long as you have. I do, however, want to make one complaint. I do wish some of them had had better taste in movies. <laughs> My thanks to the Notre Dame community would not be complete if I did not recognize the many who served on the education committees over the year, the priests and lay people who kept Notre Dame going with their efforts and generous dedication. And then a special thanks to two dear friends, Father Richard and Father Macha. Not only I, but all, all of us owe all of these community workers over the years a huge debt. Notre Dame would not be here without them. So there it is. You can see what an enormous number of people I owe thanks to. And there are still others. At the end of my long list of thank yous, I wish to thank all of those who made this evening possible. I especially want to acknowledge the Education Committee, our wonderful musicians, the bartenders, and above all, Sue and Joe, who work so hard and who organize this evening so beautifully. Thank you. In closing, okay, I, you don't need to sigh too loudly out of relief. <laughs> I want to say to all of you how much I appreciate your patience this evening. At least you can take comfort in knowing you will never have to listen to me drone on again. I just hope you understand why I have spoken at such length. I do sincerely want to express my gratitude to the entire Notre Dame community represented by all of you that have taken time out of your busy lives and helped to make it for me a night to remember. Well, for at least as long as I can remember. <laughs> I've said it before and I'll say it again. Notre Dame has been a great gig. Thanks to everyone for making it all possible and for your contribution to the rich tapestry of the last 52 years. Earlier, I mentioned that my bucket list consisted of two items. Well, I have one other item to add. Each year that I have taught at Notre Dame has resulted in my becoming more and more a part of an ever-growing family, as each year I got to know more and more students. That will no longer happen. So there is one final item on my bucket list. I hope that I will continue to be an accepted part of the community I've grown in, that I will continue to be part of the extended family of Notre Dame. It is a real, in a real sense, who I am. And the tapestry is not quite complete. So please help me to stay in touch. And one final reminder, I'd love to come to dinner. <laughs>
So we had to transpose the song because it was too high. So Aida and I spent some time together going over it and changing it a little bit. And of course, you know, Alan rewrote the last two verses, what's new, just like the play, the alumni play. Thank you, Alan. So um, hope you enjoy it because it does mean a lot to him and it's a, it's a perfect song for today. sit alone with your thoughts while the chimes ring out with a carol gay for the joy that the day has brought do you think what the end of a perfect day can mean to a tired heart when the sun goes down with a flaming ray and the dear friends have to part well this is the end of a perfect day near the end of a journey to but it leaves a thought that is big and strong with a wish which is kind and true for memory has painted this perfect day with colors that never find at the end of a perfect day the love for the friends you've made yes this is the end of a perfect day and it's time to bid you adieu. But I take on the road and continue to the glory of knowing all of you. For all that has been on this perfect day and all those I've come to love as I think of the times that we all have spent I give thanks to the Lord 